like I'm tame tonight. <laughs> Got about half the church out. I wouldn't know what to think if we had church. I love it here. I'm glad that I can go to a church for two years and still, as a pastor, I can't wait until it's church time. Amen. Just excited. Jesus. Excited about being here. Excited about seeing you. Fellowshipping with the saints. Hey, open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Well, I appreciate what the Lord has already done around here tonight. I'm not going to hold you long. It's just not even 9 o'clock, is it? First Samuel chapter three. Would y'all give me thirty minutes? Anybody? Raise your hand. Put your hand up. Thirty minutes. That's longer than that. I had about twelve. Raise your hand. I got at least six hours. If you'll give me thirty minutes and you'll help me. Oh, I didn't, I didn't trick you, sister. I didn't. Y'all think this when I'm up here? I'm getting out there. I'm like a, I'm like a hawk. That's in my radar. Amen. I had a few prayer requests. Uh, Brother Randy Welch is in need of prayer. He's having uh, a type, some type of, uh, not therapy, it's a, uh, a treatment every Tuesday for, the, for his cancer. And he has just been terribly sick. Sister Wanda Speakman, uh, Sister York has had pneumonia. Brother Bud is real sick too. We just got a lot of people that needs prayer tonight. So please remember them, Sister Alex. Lift up my brother. We just found out today his cancer's back. Harold T. cancer. Really? Let's pray for Harold T. Amen. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. If you have that, say amen. Amen. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. And that word precious means rare. There was no open vision, no prophet, no word. Not, not like in other times. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel and answered, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou hast called me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the Lord, the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. I read that just a little while again, and I thought, how in the world can you read a, a, a verse? A thousand times and not see something that powerful. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. God is speaking to him. And he's not just speaking to him. He's calling him into one of the greatest prophetic offices in the history of Israel. And the Bible said that Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou hast called me. And Eli, finally, you would think the old age man of God would have known. Finally, the, the, the priest, he deserves that God has called the child. Verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be. If he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. You remember what the subject is on Tuesday nights for a while. What is it? What are, we, what are we seeing here? God is speaking to a man, and a man is speaking back to God. Vice versa. That is prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. I am humbled at the opportunity to speak your word again, to encourage and challenge the saints to draw closer to you. I'm thankful for this altar call that you gave tonight. I'm so glad that I didn't have to give it. I'm so so glad that you just swept the house in such a mighty way that the lost can be found and the saints can be healed. The broken can be put back together again. I pray, Lord, that you would take this word and just let it be powerful. 
changes, challenges, stir us, and I pray that no one leaves the same way as they came. And we pray in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Amen. You may be seated. We discussed Tuesday night about, I'm trying to get somewhere, but many stuff is just so juicy, you know, it's just, it looks like a big fat T-bone, like a, a seven pound T-bone, you know what I'm saying, you really want to eat it all, but you just can't, it's just not, even a fat guy like me, there's just no way, and so you have to cut it up in slices, and that's just kind of what we're doing here, I'm going to try to move if I can. We discussed right before I closed out last Tuesday night about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how God came down and spoke with Adam and Eve. And it was the will of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor. It was the will of the Lord to talk to men. And I think we're discovering now that it's God's will to speak to us. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's a flattering thing. You know, it's... A lot of people say, well, I know for the day that I remember when I was in Florida, I was always getting... Now, folks don't drop my name much anymore. <laughs> It's not a it's not a good thing. You know, it's just uh, one of them things. When I was in Florida, they dropped my name a lot. And I had a pastor from all over the country, literally, maybe a, maybe a dozen times or more. They say, Brother So and so is coming by. And he said you and him was best buds. And I said, Brother Who? He said it again. I said, Oh, I don't know him. I never met him. Well, he knows you. No. I remember one year at a youth camp, one of the members I pastored, he, he spent about an hour out in the parking lot after church one night, and this fella was telling him about all the experiences that me and him had had, he and I. We grew up together, you know. And we just got in all kinds of trouble. And he was telling my church member, he said, if you only knew David Lamb, I'd never seen him in my life. Never. I've never heard his name. People think they know you, they don't know you. And people say they know me, they don't know me. They know what I do. They know that I preach, they know that I pastor, but they don't know me. God knows me. God knows you. He knows the real you. He's in three of every one of us. There's a person that you think you are, there's a person that other people think you are, and then there's a person that God sees. The one that you really are. Yeah. God sees that man. God sees that woman. And God wants to talk to that one. Amen. He wants to work on that one. He doesn't care about the facade. He doesn't care about the charade. He, the, the charade. He, he wants to talk to you. He wants to strip it down bare. He wants to get, get it to where the, the old rubber meets the road as the old saying goes. And he wants to talk to you behind the veil of pretense. All right. We have a hard time with that. We're so used to hiding from each other that we come to God and we, dear Lord, thank you, God. You know, you have to say God. You can't say God is God. <laughs> and he doesn't hear that, John. Right. It's when you get laid out prostrate in the floor and you're just squalling to yeah. the top of your lungs. and Or those times that you don't even know what to say. That's right. Have you ever been there when you didn't know what your words, what words, what could I ask for right now? I don't even know what I need. I'm just in all kinds of trouble here. I can't, I'm not sinning. I'm not, I'm not doing anything that I know of, but I'm, I'm, I'm distant from God. I can't feel it. And I don't even know what to pray anymore. You ever been there and all you can do is just cry. Did you know that tears are a language that God understands? You know, I may not understand why you're crying. People will cry. Folk will come in and they'll be torn off in pieces. And, and, and I'm just in a place now that I don't have any time to mess around. So I'll just come to you and say, are you mad at me? You say, no. Because I don't always understand you too. But God understands him. And he wants to talk to you. Now, in our text here that I read to you, we're reading about a young child. I don't know exactly how old he is. Very young. Very young. But his mother was barren. Hannah could not, Hannah, right? Hannah could not have a child. And she would go to the temple every day. And she would just cry. And she would weep. And this poor old priest, Eli, I tell you, he's a real mess. I don't have time. Time would fail me tonight, especially if I'm going to go 30, 40 an hour or whatever. We all told me I could go. Um, I don't have time. Eli has lost his discernment. Eli has lost his age. Eli is a high priest, but Eli is 
He, he's not the man that he should be. He doesn't recognize this burden that Hannah has. He thinks that she's drunk. Yeah. She said, I'm not drunk. I, I'm barren. I want a son. And, and God opens her womb. She has a child named Samuel. And she had made a vow to God that if you give me a, a man child, I'll give him back to you. And so when he came to the age of, I guess that she could take him to the temple, she did just that. Yeah. And this child Samuel is now being raised up inside the house of God. Eli is taking care of him. Eli is teaching him the ways of the temple. But the Bible says Samuel doesn't know the Lord yet. There's no open vision. There's no prophets that God can, can trust. There's no body that he can put his word in their mouth. And so this young man is something special. God sees raw potential in this young man. God sees something in Samuel he can trust. And so he calls Samuel in the middle of the night, Samuel, Samuel. But Samuel's not sensitive. He doesn't know what he's hearing. Have you ever been there? Amen. Let me explain it this way. I've seen times in my life that I would have a strange burden, a strange a feeling come over me. Somebody was in trouble. And I may or may not act on it, but I remember a few times in my life that I didn't act on it. And then you find out the next day that that same person had had a car wreck. Or had got thrown in jail. I've had it happen several times. You would think that we would be more sensitive to his voice. Did you know the Bible says that the Lord's sheep know his voice and a stranger they will not follow? I'd like to tell you that God wants to talk to you. But we're going to have to pray for sensitivity. We've got to be able to hear his voice. I believe that there's a lot of times that God speaks to us, but we're so messed up in our minds, the hustle, the bustle. We have such a storm in our minds. There's no peace in our mind. There's no rest in our minds. We're worried about this and we're worried about that, and we've got we've got just all types of chaos going on. That God tries to speak to us, but He He, uh, he could probably thunder in a way that busted your eardrums. But God is a gentleman. Have you figured that out yet? Yeah, come, on. come on, help me now. I said God is a gentleman. Yeah. Yes, I, I know some of you have been through some things today. And I know some of your minds not here tonight. And I'm just glad you came. Thank you for being here. If you can, tune in just a little more. All right? Just a little more attention. And if you can't, it, it, that's fine. I've been there where I didn't matter how good the preacher preached or taught. I just couldn't tune in because I was so messed up in my head. But that's what I'm talking about. We live like that. We go months like that. We go days like that. That ought to be the exception, not the rule. We should have our minds stayed on God. And if we have our minds stayed on God, what happens? We have perfect peace according to the Word of God. You know, that is one of the things that I can't really believe that we've not heard taught more. Is that a Christian can have perfect peace in their minds. I don't mean, you know, this is what we are programming. And you'll, I think you'll see what I'm telling the truth. Uh, when I say this, whether inadvertently or whether it was intentionally, mostly it was inadvertently. They didn't mean to. It was just, it was the way Mama was. It was the way Grandpa was. It was the way Aunt Lucy was. Uncle Billy. They taught us that the only way to have real peace was for there to be no war. Right, right. Come on. Think this thing about it. All the battle has to cease. Can't be anybody lying on you. Can't be nobody spreading lies on the rumors on you. You have to have some money in your pocket to have real peace. You can't have bills stacked up higher than your money and have peace. If you've got sickness, you can't have peace. That is kind of the way I was programmed to believe because everybody in my life, if anything bad happened, they fell apart. I know people that as soon as they end, they put a little bit of heat on. The first thing they do is they don't go to church. Come on. Well, I have too much on my mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on. That's right. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. But we've been programmed that the only way to have real peace is to have no warfare. But the problem with that is there's going to be very few times, very few moments in your life that hell is not going to rage in your Come on. We're in a war. You didn't join the Boy Scouts, brother. Sister, you didn't join the Girl Scouts. I tell my baby, sell some cookies now. 
When you said, I do, yes, sir, I will, uh -huh. you decided to join the greatest army, the greatest fighting force that has ever been known. Amen. And I promise you, there's lots of casualties. Oh, yeah. Not everybody has survived. Not everybody has made it. A lot of folks have fallen short. A lot of folks have died on the battlefield. A lot of people started in this race, started in this fight, they ended up in hell. Come on. A lot of casualties. Just because you prayed on an altar, just because you came to church last week, just because you tithed, just because you did all these things, that doesn't mean that you're going to go to heaven. You've got to get a relationship with God that is unquenchable, unshakable. You've got to get a relationship with God that is unmovable. And you can have that. But you're going to have to become sensitive to God. Because there's been times that God has answered deep prayers. And nobody knew about some of those prayers that I whispered underneath my breath. Because some of the prayers that I prayed, I was almost scared to pray them. I'm not going to elaborate. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about. And so I just kind of whispered on with my breath. And then two months later, it happened. Yeah. You ever had that happen? Yeah. Have you ever thought something that's real radical and you're afraid to even mention it out loud because somebody would lock you up and then God did it? And it had to be him. Because God is sensitive to us. But a lot of times we're not sensitive to him. There's a reason I'm, I keep addressing the issue of depression. It is a powerful spirit. Now there is a, there is a, a physical element to that, but there is a powerful spirit of depression. Powerful. And the main purpose of a spirit of depression is to engulf you in darkness and blackness. Where all you see is blackness. All you see is darkness. Now God can speak to you and God will speak to you, but a lot of times our mind is so cluttered that God cannot. And so he speaks to us and we don't even know it's him. And we run around saying, I want God to talk to me. I want God to speak to me. I want God to hear me. And God is calling your name, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. He spoke to you in a sign. He spoke to you in his word. Have you ever had God speak to you in his word? Oh, yeah. Man. In fact, I think it's a tragedy that that is not the primary way that God speaks to us. Wow. I believe in prophecy, don't you? I, I do. Yeah. I believe in prophecy. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I would rather have a scripture. Amen. Right. Yes. And I don't mean any offense to you or anybody. Yeah. We heard a powerful prophecy just Sunday. Was it Sunday? Powerful. My hair stood up and I wasn't even getting prophesied. Yeah. And I confident the man of God. Yeah. As good as I can confident any man. Period. But this word, I know. I don't have to ask. Amen. I don't have to survey its ways, its life. I don't have to survey anything. When God gives you a word out of this book, Amen. you have no doubt. Hallelujah. I have no doubt Sunday. Don't get me wrong. But Brother Greg is going to agree with what I'm saying here. He would much rather have a scripture than even old pastor. The word of God's powerful. We can get answers from the word. But if we're not sensitive, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. We've had God speak to us over and over and over and over and we're not sensitive enough. I need you to listen to me. And I don't, I don't know how messed up your mind is tonight. Boy, I feel it. It's strong in the house. A lot of messed up heads. Maybe that's the reason I'm talking like I'm talking. You need to... Now, when I say this, I'm not saying this in a sarcastic way. We need to grow up. All right. All right. Okay, I don't mean that. You need to grow up. We need to mature. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, whew, I think before next week is that I'm going to be done with discipleship 201. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. And I'm going to talk to I'm going to talk about being an ambassador. And in order to talk about discipleship and being an ambassador, I had to first explain the fact that a new convert in Christ is to receive milk. Yeah. A baby in Christ. Milk. Yes. The milk of the word. The most basic principles, the fundamental doctrines of Christ. But saints of God, I'm telling you, have you ever seen a bearded male walking around with a bottle in his mouth? I haven't either. Thank you, Jesus. I have seen some seven, eight, nine, ten year olds sucking on bottles and stuff and wearing bibs. That was a little weird to me. Why? It wasn't weird when they were three months old. 
Do you have a problem with a six-month-old baby wearing diapers and bibs and drinking bottles and sucking pacifiers? Has anybody got a problem with that? Because it's natural. It's natural. Okay? And when you're a babe in Christ, prayer, it has certain aspects and certain dynamics. And one of the things that you have to learn is the voice of of God. You've got to learn the voice of God. I mean, we're up here teaching all kinds of stuff, and, and we let people do stuff, and, and you know, the right leg in, and put your right leg out, put the right leg, do the hokey pokey, and we don't teach people how to hear the voice of God. We have more faith in our own preaching and teaching than we do in God's ability to teach His own children. But one of the reasons preachers and are so prone, you know. I, oh Lord, I gotta stop right there because I'm just about got in a lot of trouble. And I need to say that, but I don't know how to say it. Oh, uh, all right, just forget it. You know why teachers get so frustrated? And they come in here and they just pound and beat. They throw the Bible. They get their water bottle and try to hit you in the head. It's because they're not adequate enough. They're not anointed enough. They're not studied enough to teach the people the Word of God. Amen. And so they get mad. You know how it is you get frustrated. Are you stupid? <laughs> now who's stupid? Come on, talk to them. Really? Whose fault is it? Is it the 12-year-old the, the who is trying to learn? Or is it the teacher's fault? Might be a little bit of both. But you're supposed to be a teacher. They're a student. They may have a learning disability. Guess what? You've got to figure out how to teach them. Come on. All right? I'm a child in Christ. I'm an elder in Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. You need to know the voice of God. But the more that you grow in Him, the more sensitive you should become to His voice. You should be able to hear him in the middle of a storm if you've been serving the Lord for five, ten years. There ought to be no question as whose voice is speaking to you. If there's ten thousand voices, if there's a million voices, and they're pulling you this way, and they're pulling you that way, when he speaks, you ought to know that voice just like that. Amen. I've come across a lot of people that know some about his word, but they don't really know his voice. And there is a difference. There has been times that I've quoted but the word didn't get me through but I heard his voice and his voice was more real at that time than any scripture that I ever memorized now, I know it's the same I know it's the same validity I know it's the same power the same authority but I knew his voice it was real and it was alive it was active Amen. sometimes to my everlasting shame I quote verses from here but they don't really get in my spirit other times I just quote the word and it's just, it's all. Yeah. It's boom, 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 boom. But the Lord anoints me to quote them. And you spit them out left and right. Yeah. There has to be a sensitivity to his voice. You've got to be able to hear him. He's got to be able to calm you in the middle of chaos. Amen. As a babe in Christ, I don't have a problem with you running around with a pacifier in your mouth. I don't have a problem with somebody that's been saved for a year, falling all apart, and saying, oh, God don't love me no more. God's let me. I don't have a problem with that. Come on. I mean, as long as you bounce back. Now, if you go crazy and you leave church, that's a problem. But I've seen young converts, new babes in Christ, who just didn't know where God was. They weren't, they weren't tuned in to His voice enough. And God was speaking to them. And they were still reaching, still going to church, still trying. And they were confused because they didn't, they didn't know if God was speaking. They didn't know where God was at. And I'll be honest, I've been serving the Lord for a long time. And there's still times in my life I'm saying, God, where are you? Anybody agree? Yeah. God, where are you? A baby in Christ, I understand that. But when I see elders, olders, age, those that are full age, spending most of their life in uproar, in upheaval, in chaos, all the time, not knowing God's voice, not knowing His direction, 72 years old and don't know what God has got for you, 53, been saved for 78 years, and don't know which direction God wants you to go. There's something wrong with that. We've got to become more sensitive to His voice. But the only way to do that is to be really concerned. 
about his voice. You've got to want to learn his voice. I mean, really, very seldom am I fooled. I could hear 10 kids cry, but if I heard my child cry most of the time, I'm going to know my child's distinct voice over anybody else's. Are you all the same way? Amen. Amen. We need to be more sensitive to his voice. Because, you know, I, I preached a lot, and I'm going to talk to you about this in, in later, later on, maybe the next Tuesday night. About, a, probably not next Tuesday night. A life of prayer. A prayer life. These, these contrasting ideas. Life of prayer, prayer life, life of prayer, prayer life. Now we've been talking, you need to pray, 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 pray. I would agree with that. Yeah. I teach that. Pray, pray, pray. Find time with God and pray. Seek His face. Yeah. Don't let a day go by that you don't find some place in solitude. Right. Shut the door, Jesus said, in your prayer closet. Shut everything out, all the influences out and pray. But there's a truth that needs to be taught that's much more powerful than getting into a ritual of prayer. I've, I've prayed thousands of hours and I doubt God even, 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 even heard any of it because it was just motions. It's just ritual. Not saying, praying. A conversation between you and God. There's a truth that needs to be spoken. And it's a truth that you're going to have to get if you're ever going to grow in Christ. And that is that we need a life of prayer. Where is that text? First Thessalonians 5.7. I think I got it here close. 5.17. The Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing. Now, are we to suppose that that means that you need to build an altar? And just carry it around, a literal altar, and carry it around on your back all the time, and just pray, oh Lord, and you get fired from every job. You can't even really get your application filled out, can't go in for an interview, because the whole time you're just praying in tongues. I saw you, I said, well, that'd be good enough, it wouldn't. That's why Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all, but I'd rather speak five words with understanding, so you can edify, you can know, you can hear. There comes a point you've got to come back down to earth, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. He's not saying pray on an altar 24 hours a day. He says have a mind of prayer. Yeah. A spirit of prayer. Yeah. An attitude of prayer. And I know that kind of sounds radical. And I know that we call people like that fanatics. But in the New Testament, they just call them Christians. Right. Amen. Yeah. Are y'all that sleepy tonight? Yeah. We got any folders around here? <laughs> Wake up and smell the coffee. I'm going to quit at a quarter after, no matter where I'm at. I might start back up immediately after, but I'm going to quit. <laughs> we need to grow in Christ. Yes. We need to mature in Him. You can't stay where you're at forever. I'll give you a year. Give me two years. As long as God will give you. I, I, I mean, I'm not the judge. I'm not the great potentate who tells people how long they have. You know, like the one pastor said, bless God. If they don't shape up in 30 days, I'm shipping them out. He needs to be shipped out. Uh, he needs to be shipped out. He needs to get saved. I'm not your judge, but I will tell you this. That there is a natural progression from a baby in Christ to becoming a man or a woman of God. And you've got to get there somewhere. There comes a point. There comes a point, brothers and sisters, that we've got to mash you up some green beans. We got to get you some potatoes. We got to mash them up. And I know I, I get them in little jars and I try to, oh, they're nasty. Give me some salt and pepper. You know, there comes a point where you got to eat some hamburger and some, some steak and you got to get some meat. You can't stay where you're at forever. Amen. You've got to get to where you can go through hell and high water and not fall apart. And the only way you can do that is you've got to have a life of prayer. You have got to be connected to Him and never unplug. I know that we call that radical. Maybe it is compared to a lot of people. I don't know how you all survive. I don't know how people survive that don't walk in His Spirit every day, every moment. Because the moment that I unplug, I begin to die. The moment that I unplug, it's like an oxygen mask. It's like being shot in the outer space without an oxygen mask. You're going to die immediately. We're not of this world. We are in this world, but we don't belong in this world. We belong to God. We're aliens. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. I cannot breathe. 
breathe this world's oxygen. That's the reason we preach about worldliness and not, not being worldly minded and not being tapped in. There's so much to this world that you can't let go of it because I can't survive in this atmosphere. I must walk in the spirit or I will fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the spirit it, and, and you can fall out and it's okay with me. I'm not going to I'm not here to dispute and debate with you. I believe that baptism in the Holy Ghost is exactly what Paul is talking about when he says walk in the spirit. But the Pentecostal church has, has reduced the baptism in the Holy Ghost to a one moment experience where you jiggle to jaw a little bit and you got up off the altar and you got no more power than you did when you was 14 years old and they said that you got saved. You don't know God any more than you did back when you was a child. I believe a real baptism in the Holy Ghost will change your environment. It'll change your outlook. It'll change your lifestyle. It'll change the way that you correspond to humanity. It'll let you take a licking and keep on ticking. And folks will say, how did she make it through? And you say, it's the baptism in the Holy Ghost, brother. If it wasn't for the breath of God, I'd have been going a long time ago. My, my, my. It is just the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be I get in the spirit. It's supposed to be I'm in the spirit all the time. I know it's semantics. Bless God. I'm going to get anointed in a few minutes. Shut up, sit down. I remember I went to a church one time. I don't know why I went there now. Well, I am at home. I went to a church, man. I had something on my heart. I needed to preach so bad. They didn't want me to preach so bad. <laughs> and they got the old elder preacher up. He preached 20 minutes. And they kept saying, hold on just a little bit. I'll get anointed in a few minutes. I'll get anointed in a few. <laughs> it probably wasn't semantics with him. We should be anointed. A Christian shouldn't have to get anointed. I love it when people say this to me. Because, I mean, I'm glad that they can say it to me. But it's also kind of funny. When they say, I like Bill Lamb now. He's the same everywhere. He's the same at the house. He's the same at church. He's the same at Walmart. Yeah, Man, what you're saying is, it's like I said, every time I meet Bill Lamb, he's white. <laughs> really? Woo! Every time I see Bill Lamb, he's fat. Oh. Come on, guys. Amen. To say that every time I see a Christian, he's a Christian, that's a little silly, isn't it? Right. Every time I see Brother Greg, he's a man. <laughs> there should be no variation. There should be no variation. You should be a Christian in the morning. You should be a Christian at noontime. You should be Christian at nighttime. You ought to be a Christian when you got money. When you don't got money, you ought to be Christian when you're feeling good. When you're in the emergency room. When, you, when your husband's dead, your wife's dead. When you're having a new baby. You ought, you ought to be a Christian all the time. There ought not be a moment that you're not a Christian. But you can't fake this and have that kind of experience. They say, oh, folks go to church. or plugged into church. Then they fall apart whenever trials come. It's because they're not walking in the spirit. They're not really connected to God. I'm telling you, I know y'all think that I just like saying it, and I kind of do like saying it, but when you're really plugged into God, you can take a licking. That's right. That's what my favorite say. Come on, come on. And not only can you take a licking, you ought to just be able to just take it and just keep moving. Yeah. You go, man, he don't ever go through anything. Right. And smile. Woo! We got to get there, brothers and sisters. We got to get to the place where we quit fall. We don't fall apart every moment, every day. Every time something comes along, we fall apart. You're, you're still a babe in Christ if that's your problem. Amen. If every time somebody lies on you, you just fall all out. You can't even, you can't even function. Oh, Jesus. You are a babe in Christ. Amen. Now, if you got saved six months ago, it's okay. You're going to learn. If you're sitting up in here and you've been serving the Lord 20 years, come on. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not beating you down, y'all. No, I'm not, not rebuking you. I'm not scolding you. I'm telling you, it's the truth. you are embryonic. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Amen. You need to grow up. You need to mature. 
You need to pray, God, please help me grow up. Man, I need to say something. I'm going to get in trouble. Man. All right. He's 20 years old. He's stout as a ox. He won't work a lick. And he's, he's drawing food stamps. And he's on welfare. And he's on everything else. I think a 20-year-old man should be getting a job. Amen. Somebody say J-O-B. J-O-B. Ain't Job, that's job. <laughs> now, you know, and one of the things that bothers me about the people is always ripping on food stamps. Listen, there's people that are sponsored in the system. There is. But they got kids. You listen to me. You listen to me carefully. They got kids. You hear me? And them kids cannot make a living. Them kids cannot feed themselves. So if I gotta pay taxes to get little Junior some green beans and some good food, so be it. Stop complaining. It is what it is, okay? But when you're 20 years old and you're strong enough to get a job, go get a job. Work. Do like Brother Samuel. Chop down big trees. Load big loads of wood. Haul them jokers off like him and Brother Spencer do. It's the same way, spiritually speaking. Am I in trouble? Did I get in trouble there? Was that okay? Yeah. Spiritually speaking, if you're handicapped like I was, I ain't going to go there. It took me a little while to get to where I needed to go. Some of you weren't raised in a solid Bible-believing home. It took you a little while. Some of us are still dealing with the effects of the past. No matter where you're at, no matter who you are, there has to be some type of progression. And when you're falling apart all the time, it lets me know that you're not walking in Christ like you're supposed to. I'm going to say this right here. Did you ever notice what Jesus was doing when the woman with the issue of blood touched him? You remember that scripture? You remember that? Do you remember what Jesus was doing when she fell and grabbed a hold of him with his garment? He's just walking. right. He's going from point A to point B, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. He's not holding a prayer line. He's not holding a healing crusade. He's not in revival. He's just walking down the old dusty road. He didn't pray for her. He didn't pull out the anointing oil. She touched him, and she was healed. And he stopped, and he said, who touched me? They said, Master, you got a thousand people around you. And you asked who touched you? He said, but I felt you flow out of me. That is what we're supposed to do. Did you know that I am not supposed to be your example? The ultimate example is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you can follow me as, as somebody say as, as, as I follow Christ. But you've got to do so with one eye. You just got to squint real hard and make sure you watch me real close. Because I'm a man just like you and I'm prone to fall just like you. But we know Christ never fails. So I saying that. I don't have a problem telling you to look to the elder sisters in our church and, and learn what you can from them. I don't have a problem with telling you young ladies that you can look to the first lady and that you can learn how to be a woman of God. I don't have a problem with that. But what I do have a problem with is when we use men as the ultimate measuring post, the measuring stick. Because men are not. Because this man, no matter how good he is, no matter how holy she is, she has to look somewhere for, for also as a measuring stick. And that measuring stick is the Lord Jesus Christ, if I can say it that way. His word, who he was, who he is, how he conducted himself. You want to know how to treat people? Find out how to figure out Jesus treated people. That's how you treat people, all right? And so when I see Jesus walking down the road, and he doesn't have to get the anointing all out, and he doesn't have to say, oh, God, in the name of Jesus, and spit on them, and, and rock and on Master hair all up, and, and pray and on, and dump 17 gallons of oil on it. He just walked in it, but he is so anointed. Come on. He's so anointed. It's so real in his life. He's just walking. He's just talking. He's just living life. But he's so anointed. He's so tapped in that a woman can come behind him who has been sick for many, many years, who has spent every dime. It is a frustrating time for her. She has come to the end of a rope. She has spent everything she has. This man has not addressed her. He has not looked. 
went too tapped into this world. Oh yeah. What a stupid saying, too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That's right. That's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, that's what they say. The more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you're going to be. There is nothing the people in inhabitants of this planet need more than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. You are not Christ, but Christ should be living and breathing and moving and having his being through this people. Amen. People ought to say, I saw Christ. Say, where did I see him? I saw him and her. Right. Amen. I talked to Jesus today. How did you do that? Well, brother so and so. Right. He's full of Christ, and I can feel God's spirit. That's the way it should be all the time. Amen. You know, we, we we wax so spiritual, and we think that we're at the height of spirituality when we're in a church service. No. We think that we're at the height of our spirituality when we're teaching and preaching and singing and witnessing and walking the door. I believe that we're at the height of our spirituality when we're sitting at a kitchen table and we're laughing and playing and we're still filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on. I'll explain to you what I'm saying. Anybody can get spiritual in here. But it takes a real walk with God to go down the aisle at Walmart and just shake a hand and say, how's the weather? And they walk away and say, man, there's something about him. Yeah, come on. That's the real stuff. That's the kind of anointing that every person in this house should have. You should have the kind of walk with God that you don't have to speak the name of Christ because you're so anointed by him that it is irrefutable. He is in you. He is with you. And his presence in your life will affect and change the lives of everybody you come in contact with. Is that too radical for us tonight? Uh -huh. I, I know it's not bottle stuff. I know I know that's a little bit media, but it's just it just is what it is. And you don't go to bed a blunder. That's right. You, you don't get a you don't get the kind of anointing by playing around with the world and worried about pride and, and you know folks are so physically you know minded. How they look, how they dress, how their hair. You're going to be ugly no matter what you do. I really don't mean that. Because I believe you are beautiful. But the facts of it are, that's ugly. And God hates a proud look. He hates it. He despises the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You know what it requires to be humble? It requires a vision of Him. Yeah. Because as long as I compare myself to you, I'm finding crap in your armor. There's nobody in this house I can't find an area. Just like there's not a person in this house that can't find something in them. Whether it's real, whether it's fabricated, whether it's just you don't like my attitude or the way I say something. Everyone in this house has got flaws. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. On your best day, you're still really messed up. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a whole lot of amens, but I just say, for, Amen, preacher. You're right. Amen. I know you guys. I know people. We're all messed up. Yeah. And if you was perfect, your wife would be crazy. <laughs> and if your wife was perfect, then you'd be crazy. It's all good. Everybody's got a monkey on the shoulder back. Yeah. If not, then we wouldn't need a savior, would we? You're going to be tapped into Christ to be humble. Because if you're tapped into Christ and you're always seeing Him, you're good and I love you, but you're nothing compared to Him. Amen. Shout amen. amen. I said you're good, you're lovely, you're my favorite people, but you are nothing. You're nobody. You're absolutely zero. You're counterproductive compared to Him. He is perfect. He is, he is flawless. Amen. He is infallible. I don't care how holy you think or, or how holy you actually are. You come into his presence, my brother, my sister. You will lay on your face and say, Woe is me, for I am undone. That is the only way to be truly humble. There is a voluntary humility. The kind is faith. Do you know what I'm talking about? Behold my humility? Yeah. Um, that's not real humility. Real humility comes from a brokenness and it only comes through Christ. Jesus is our example. He is our example. He's so full of the Holy Ghost that virtue flowed from him even when he was aware of the woman approaching him. This is what I mean by a life of prayer. 
I'm not, I'm not telling you that every person that touches your coat is going to get healed. What I'm telling you is there's a deeper place in God that we all need to be striving to go to. Amen. David said in Psalm 57, verse 7, I'm going to have to apologize. I went 10 minutes beyond, and I don't know if somebody said he lied. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I didn't mean to lie. I, I, I really planned on stopping at 30 minutes. Go ahead, Pat. But I just wanted to get through this particular point right here. Psalm 57 and 7. I want you to commit this to memory. Folks will walk out on his own. He said he's going to quit in a minute. He preached 13 seconds longer. <laughs> and really the fall lies in us. <laughs> David said, my heart is fixed, oh God. My heart is fixed. This doesn't mean my heart has been repaired or back together. There's a nail right here. Big old hook. I think it'd probably hold me up. I'm not going to try it, but it probably would. I'd end up in a bad <laughs> That That's the word picture that, that Psalm 57 7 is giving us. A nail in a sure place, fastened, concrete, unmovable. David said, My heart. No matter what happens, no matter what the issue is, what you see that this closure. Thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna put the watch back on and we'll put Do you know his voice? I want to challenge you before we go home tonight. You gotta survey your life. Amen. Now, Steve, I won't be honest with you, brother. If you talk, if I heard that you said something bad about me, you would hurt me. Sammy, you could you could hurt me. Russell, you could drive me to power, brother. I know you wouldn't. I'm just saying. I am vulnerable to you. I have no walls. I have Brothers, I have no walls. You can hurt me. But these are my my brothers and my sisters. I do that sometimes and I get hurt a lot. They, they hurt me. But I love you that much, Sister Alice. I don't have any walls with you. Now, if I was to hear that you would badmouth me and said bad things about me, I'd get over it. I'd keep preaching. I'd, they'd hurt me. But guys, there comes a point where you know who gossipers are. Yeah. You know who they you know the people that's going to talk about you. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Okay, watch this. I want you in your mind right now think of three people that talk about you all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just about said, now I'd say their names real fast, but y'all that took me seriously probably done it. Don't do that. Okay. I want you to think about that person. And I want you to make a mental note of this. Number one, they need God's mercy. Amen. They need to be saved. If you get angry with them, guess what you can't do anymore? You can't pray for them. You can try, but it's not going to be a fake stand when we're going to go home. I said, if they anger you, you can't really pray for them. And if you're not praying for them, do you think anybody else is? No, because they gossip about everybody. So we need to be in prayer for them. Number two, number two, if you know they're gossipers and you know that they talk about people and they know that they talk about you, stop letting them affect you. I'll tell this story when we pray. I've told it before, but I just... Where's, is Brittany in here somewhere? Where's she at? Where's it? Where's it? Brittany? How you doing? I'm going to tell the story. She don't like it anymore. I told her like a thousand times. We had a trailer, a double wide trailer in, in Florida. And the kitchen and dining room was separated with by a, a counter and some cabinets that hang down. So you could see through into the dining room. There was no wall. And that corner of that cabinet was sharp. Where's my wife? She run off? She hit her head on that count cabinet every day. For weeks. Bam. 
I thought, man, we're going to do something about that. Then one day it dawned on me. Them cabinets haven't moved the whole time, except when her head hit it and got it shook. They've been stable, Brother Paul. The cabinets ain't moving. It wasn't like she went in the refrigerator and they just swung out and hit her in the head. Now, that would be a problem. The problem really wasn't the cabinet. And I have to confess, I wish she was in here because I'm talking about this in here. I run into it a few times myself. I never did punch them cabinets. I never did haul off and say, you idiot, pow, because I knew whose fault it was. Are y'all with me? The first couple times, okay, that's cool. Ten times, twelve times, fifteen times, twenty years. Somewhere down the line, you've got to quit blaming the cabinet. Some people just do what some people do. And they're never going to change. They're going to always be there. They're going to always hit you in the head. So why don't you start looking? Come on in the kitchen, get your milk and say, I got my eye on you. <laughs> Open up the refrigerator, get your milk and get on out of there. Stop letting people dictate your walk with God. Yeah. Stop it. Stop letting people knock you out of victory and joy and peace. Get connected to Christ and stay connected to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. I thank you for the awesome opportunity to preach and teach your word. I thank you for the spirit in this house. I thank you for the kindness of the people. I did definitely intend on teaching 30 minutes. You did so much already, but they were gracious enough to stay with me for 20 more minutes. And I'm thankful for this people because they truly love your word. Amen. But God, we didn't just come in to hear teaching. We come to hear something that's going to change our life. I pray that from this moment forward, no matter what is said about the people in this house, no matter what phone call they get, that they will learn to brush it off. I pray, God, that they will learn that they can be victorious in you no matter what. But it requires them staying connected to you, being sensitive to you, walking in your spirit every day, every moment, every hour. I pray that you show them the next time they get upset, the next time they get angry at what someone said, how fickle it really is. God, I pray that you would show them that at the end of the day, if they did everything their enemy said they should do, then their enemy would call them a goody two-shoes. Then their enemy would say, look how proud he is. God, help us to get our minds stayed on you. Help us to get our minds upon the kingdom of God. Help us to march forward. Help us to learn that we can walk on water in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the night, because you're out here with us. Amen. Help us to be tuned in to you. Help us to know your voice. I pray for the elders that are here. We cry and people hurt us, but God, it ought not cause us to be sidetracked from our destination. I pray for those here that don't have any victory, any peace in their mind at all, that you would teach them, God, the truths of this lesson. We pray in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Thank you for coming tonight. Let our visitors know how much you appreciate them. God bless you.